Hi, my name is Benedict for Higher Hertz. Today we're going to look at Roland Cloud. So we'll look a little at the cloud bit itself, the, the whole package, uh, and then specifically more at the Xenology, Xenology Pro thing, because uh, that's probably the most directly comparable with the bigger VST synths that are out there. And the, the questions are going to be, well, A, is it good? Is it good value for money? Does it deliver on its promise of being this amazing sound that you can't get elsewhere? Um, and I think it's a very interesting proposition either way. Therefore, it leads to an interesting set of arguments or discussion points. At no point am I saying that this is right or wrong, but merely an interesting set of discussion points to perhaps help you if you're looking at making a decision yourself. It's not for me to say what you should or should not use, but it is for me as a reviewer to give some points. And I will deliberately try to avoid the same stuff that everybody's talking about, because there's just not much point. You can go watch all those other videos that are already there. There's plenty of them. So, of course, the Roland Cloud. The Cloud from Roland is a way of accessing Roland sounds without having to buy a Roland keyboard. Uh, you can still access a lot of these same sounds whilst buying modern Roland keyboards. It's an interesting approach which no one else is quite doing or quite got their grasp around. So the cloud gives you several different options as to how you can be in. It is primarily a subscription-based services, but there is an alternative, which we will look at. When you land on their page, it does talk straight away as though you're going to spend X amount per month or year. It's a subscription, so $2.99 a month. They're definitely what in car to sales terms is referred to as reducing to the ridiculous. Look, sir, for the price of a cup of coffee a week, you could have this Rolls Royce and your grandchildren will be paying for it. Cloud, we're not gonna get into discussing whether subscriptions are right or wrong. I believe in paying for things, and I believe that, that it's well worth committing to things of great value. And I think that if it suits you, there is great value in the Roland thing. How you choose to get there is gonna be up to you. So basically you've got a core package, a pro package, and an ultimate package, but there is also a free package, which is pointed out in lots of places, but then it gets difficult to know how to get there. And that is one of the funny things about it. Uh, there's a certain amount of marketing that's ending up leading the product, which I think is a shame. But the more you spend, the more you get. The obvious aim there for them is to say, well, you need ultimate because you're going to feel great if you've been given absolutely everything. Is this really the right way to go? <sighs> That's your business. But if you watch me and see my previous videos, you'll probably know that I'm likely to say probably not, which is why this is going to focus more on the Xenology thing. Uh, but when you first subscribe, then you get given a 30-day trial of the ultimate. So you get to pick your way through anything and everything that's there, and 30 days is not going to be enough to pick through it with anything resembling grace or dignity, which is part of another reason why I won't try. You can go and have a look at all the lists on Roland Cloud's site. You've probably seen it. You don't need me to say TB303 or TR808 like we're all going to get, you know, feel uncomfortable in our underpants because of me saying it. That's, that's kind of pointless. We're not going to gain anything from that. So it's probably a pretty darn fair offer. They do also offer that you can purchase a perpetual license for a device. And you can purchase obviously quite a lot of devices if you want as many as whatever is available. Uh, you do just still need to be a member, but you can use this free membership. To get to the free membership, you actually have to sign yourself up for a paid membership and then cancel it which we do need to look at. But the ability to purchase something for eternity is far better than it initially appears. The problem with the subscription thing is if I stop paying for whatever reason, I lose access to everything. 
If, however, I have purchased a perpetual license, I don't have to be paying so long as I've still got myself signed up to their internet dongle service, uh, then I've still got access to it. Uh, the internet dongle service just polls itself every now and then to make sure that I'm still a fit and proper person. While some people might want to get all like this spying on me about it, it's a pretty darn fair system and no different from iLock, broadly speaking. It does, interestingly enough, continue to give you updates. So if I were to purchase, say, Xenology Pro, Pro, uh, then I don't have to pay per month, per year, and any updates that come to it over time should automatically end up in my door. So that, I think, is a, is a pretty fair thing, but you do have to spend some time really kind of reading, looking at the FAQs to fully understand what the offer is. But once you understand that, if it suits you, I think it's a very fair offer. So kudos to, to Roland, who are to some extent pioneering this and trying to work out what will and will not fly, in that they are giving us options. So if I decide I want to own only one of these devices and couldn't give a flying banana peel about the others, then that is exactly what I can do. And to keep being able to use it, all I need to do is still be attached to their internet dongle service. Can't really complain about that. So the question that we, we need to ask is, why would we Roland Cloud? Well, the answer is one of those sort of snake eating its own tail answer, because Roland. Roland have a unique position in the industry and sometimes it's missed for what it is and there is something, sorry the cat's in the room moving around, and there is something that Roland deliver that really I don't think anybody else has actually delivered and what you're buying into far more than anything else is the Roland sound. You are buying access into the Roland sound. The ability to generate and use the Roland sound yourself in your own studio. That's something. It used to be easy enough to do that. You'd uh, dance on Dan La Dolce Vita to your music store and say, excuse me, Mr. Music Salesman, can I buy myself a Jupiter 8 or a JX3P um, or a JX8P or a D50? And he would go, yes, sir, you can do that. That's going to be $5,000. And you'd be like, yeah, and you'd go home and you'd be like, <laughs> Roland Sand. And while I may seem funny about it, I struggle with Roland Sand myself. I really struggle to make music with Roland Sand. I have had Roland gear, but it tends to be the stuff that is the last picked up thing in the studio. Uh, so if I seem funny about it, it's simply because I struggle to use it myself. However, at the same time, so many of the records that I adore are covered in Roland Sand, and the Roland Sand is part of what I adore. So it's one of those funny kind of things. Maybe sometime in the future I will have another piece of Roland gear in my arsenal, and it'll finally click with me, and I'll go, ooh, and then I'll become a Roland man. But until that time, I will flirt with Roland things and try to get my version of Roland Sand but probably resist actually going down the Roland Road because every time I've gone down it, I've ended up going, I don't like this thing. I like when other people use it. When Duran Duran use it, I love it. But when I use it, I don't love it. So let me play you something to ask ourselves, is the Roland sound worth it? Sorry, my embarrassment there. That's actually not Roland. I know, I'm being mean. But I did this accidentally to, to a client who was in my studio, and he's like, oh, wow, that's amazing. And I was like, yeah, unfortunately, uh, that was Reasons Europa. Let's listen to Roland. Now 
that's real nice too. What I'd done is I had Xenology Pro and was trying to get my head around how do I make this thing work. I'd made a sound and finally was felt like, oh, I'm starting to make something that works. And it's like, ooh, <laughs> that jealous Blade Runner. Gotta love that. Played it out. And then being me, I always go, well, what is this doing? How How is this achieving what it achieves? So I pulled up a synth I know super well and said, okay, how close can I get to this? Can this Roland thing deliver a thing that I can't deliver myself given a clear target? And cloned it. So... The thing that we learn out of there is that while those two sounds are not exactly the same, to most people they're not going to notice a difference. So can the Roland Cloud deliver a sound that is so unique that you couldn't get there other ways? Well, no, not really. But to some extent, yes, because there's something about the Roland sound, there's something they do that I haven't put my things on how they get that done. So there is a roll in sand, and while you can go a fair way to duplicating it, and the irony in this situation is that it's a duplication of a Yamaha CS80, but nonetheless we won't go too far down that little road. But we can obviously create a lot of that if we know what we're looking for. Enough that most people aren't going to tell the difference, which is why there's quite a lot of clone instruments out there of uh, particularly Junos and things like that. And if you see, I did a review on the, the Mercury 4, which is a Jupiter 4 clone. It is a doable thing to get close enough for knife fighting, and that is more than close enough for knife fighting, that little clone there. But you see at the end there, I actually ran the pair of them together, and suddenly they become even richer again. Now, this is a big key to the Roland sound, which we will come back to in a little bit. Now, I said we would look at the things around the free trial. It's not easy to get to. You actually have to kind of look around, and, and I was sort of nervous. I was like, okay, you're saying to me that I have to actually sign up for a paid account to try your thing. I don't mind signing up an account to try your thing, but you're asking me to pay to try the thing you said I could get for free. It's uncomfortable. It, however, it is what they say it is, but it's not as elegant as it could be. To get your free trial to see if this is the, the right beast for you, you do have to sign up for one of the paid memberships. I ended up signing up for the core, because if they're going to gouge me, well, I want to be gouged as little as possible. Thank you very much, sir. The bill comes back as zero. However, if I don't actually stop this in 29 and a half days time, they will bill me and bill me and bill me and bill me and bill me until one of us dies. I don't love that business model. It's the, well, we'll, we'll get you to sign yourself up for a thing that you're then going to have to unsign yourself for. Now, maybe they will be super fair and send me, are you sure you want to stay in the house? Okay, and that'll be fair. But if not at the moment, I don't know this. So right now, I'm signed up for a thing I'm not actually committed to. I've already handed across my PayPal or my credit card account for them to start taking my money. So I've put a reminder in my calendar of Google to say, cut that string. Simply because if I don't have a reminder and there is nothing to remind me, then they will start taking money from my account for a thing that I may not want. So I felt uncomfortable in the setup of this relationship, which is, I think, a thing that I should not feel uncomfortable in. So yes, you can cancel a subscription and they do tell you how to do that, but you have to look to find out how to do it. And I think that that's, from these days, an incredibly backwards role for 
the opt in in that this has become an auto opt in and you have to opt out of handing your money across to somebody for a product that you didn't actually choose to commit to. All I've committed to was checking it out. And that's cool. It's great. Thanks for letting me check it out. Falcon, I can't check out at all. So that's good. But just be aware and manage yourself going into this fella. Another thing I figured I would have a look at, seeing it's there, is Zenbeats. I just did a whole, you know, what's the best door for beginners? So, you know, being a little bit of a sucker for these things, it's like, oh, well, what's this got to offer? It's an app that runs on appy devices, not remotely interested. But they also say it's going to run on my computer. Okay, fair enough. Why not? So, here, boys and girls, I made... A little bit of a thing to see, okay, what happens? How does this work? Now, whilst this is getting set up, I must say I struggled with this getting set up as well. I had to restart the Roland Cloud Manager on my computer a couple of times before things really came through to be what they said they were going to be. So you may find that their process is just a little clunkified. But nonetheless, get this thing here. Hey, it actually looks like a door it's got a kind of a nice feel about it. Okay, that's pretty terrible. It really is pretty terrible. But I've always taken the approach when looking at a door, especially a beginner's type door, is that how is a beginner going to approach this? So I try to write things as simply as I can, like I was, as I said last time, sitting on my floor with a couple of keyboards and a cassette for a track. So what's, what's it going to be like? Am I going to feel like, oh, this is helping me? Or am I going to feel like, uh, I want to kill myself? There are a few little issues getting myself there, but you know, it, it mostly works. The biggest issue I had with this was working out how to make any one of these MIDI things, clips, longer than one bar. For some reason, they seem to be just stuck at a bar. Eventually, I kind of worked it out. Don't ask me to tell you exactly how I worked it out, but I did. It seems to be something more in the MIDI clip that I could work out how to change that. I have read somewhere that you can't go more than eight bars. It's not ideal, but bearing in mind who's likely to be using this, probably not a biggie. You get access to whatever you have downloaded from the cloud if you're in, especially Ultimate. So if you're in Ultimate, then you can, now what do we do here? Ah, it's clicking on the instrument. Clicking up there gets you nothing. Clicking on the instrument gets you stuff. You can change your instrument. So we've got access to things. Now at the moment, I have downloaded System 100, the 808, the 5080, and Xenology Pro. If I had downloaded other things, Jupyter 8s and what have you, they would show here as well. If you have not downloaded those because you have not you know, gone down that path, then you get everything from Electrosynth up. And ZC1 is, let's close that there, a cut-down version of the Zen Core, ZC, Zen Core, <laughs> uh, that is an intro thing. So it's primarily a preset machine, but it's exactly the Zen Core thing, just hobbled. So you get the Roland sound. So using this doesn't mean that you're getting Roland sound light. You're getting Roland accessibility light, but Roland sound full as such. So you can create your tracks. And of course, we've got a, a TB, or a TR-808. And it sounds, well, quite a bit like an 808, oddly enough. They do a pretty good job of emulating their own instruments. And I know that sounds kind of stupid, but they do nail their own sound really rather well. Not perfect perfect, but a lot of that perfect perfect sound is a result of things that you can't emulate inside the box. So as such, it works really well. EQ is odd, you've just got a top and bottom, but you know what, it actually works nicely. 
So I was able to take this sand and narrow it down so that we still had something resembling a bit of space for our 808 machine. It works fine. You've got a slightly unusual approach, but you've got access to plugins, which are part of the, the Xenology thing, I believe. They are not the world's best public plugins, but they are millions of miles away from being the world's worst. They are all workable plugins. They're not things that are going to be like, ooh, disgusting. The only thing that I actually had issue with was the, oh, we can put ourselves into full mixer mode, uh, the limiter. Uh, limiter, oh, it shows me now, but if you haven't got the full package, then it tries to get you to level up with points. I mean, this is not an effing video game, boys and girls. Guys, Roland, treat yourself with more respect, because if you don't treat me with respect as a customer and you make it act like Ready Player One, then anyone who's remotely serious is going to go, this is just like a video game, and they're going to walk away. So there's a certain amount of gamification, but the limiter, uh, it does operate but it operates with the uh, hammer of Thor. It works on the assumption that uh, if you want to limit, you actually just want to bludgeon. Uh, it was interesting, shall we say. It's probably this preset setting here, which I'm not gonna go into, but you don't actually need to do it. But it's basic, it's a little clunky, but it's also elegant enough to work and to work quite nicely. So you can go through the various options of how things work. You've got sends as well. So you can hear I'm sending to a reverb and the reverb built in was okay. It's usable enough. So if you wonder about Zen Beats and you're just beginning and you haven't committed to a door end, but you're going to commit to the, the wrong cloud, there are worse places to start. Now let's dig into the Roland Cloud thing and the Roland way. Because remember, there's one thing that Roland do well, and that's being Roland. There's a whole pile of stuff that Roland don't do well, or perhaps more to the point, choose not to do at all. And that is not Roland. So there is a, a pretty clear divide. If you come in here going, oh, you know, I like I like that D50 sound, but I'd like to play around with some Yamaha style FM, hard limit not going to happen. So you will find that there's no Yamaha style FM, there's no Casio style phase distortion, there is no additive, so no Kwai K5000 tile of synthesis. And I'm not saying these people should be cloning other people's stuff at all. Some of it they do. <laughs> You'll see a Prophet 5 filter clone. But if you're looking for the broadest model, if you're going, oh, well, will um, Zen, sorry, will Zenology um, or Roland Cloud replace Serum for my wave warping? No, it won't even try. Roland does Roland. It's a strength and a weakness. <laughs> There are few sounds like this. This is the D50, and I'm going to start at the D50 for the moment, just jettisoning everything before it. Uh, as I said, if there's enough interest, I may well come round and do something around Jupiter's and what have you. But for the moment, we're looking at the Xenology, how it got there, and its its history. But you listen to this, there's a tremendous pin-sharp clarity while sounding very nice. That's the bit about the Roland sound. I don't get how they do that. Good on them. Then the XV50. Again, note that really clear, bright thing. That was supposed to be the XV50. There we go. 
very clear and bright. There's not a lot of bottom end. And note the same thing with their, their 808, not a lot of bottom end. So part of that roll and sound is not a lot of bottom end and it gives them this huge clarity. And you will have heard D50 and um, 1080, the, that series, the 80 series, across just about every movie you've watched since about 1988. Just everywhere. So much so sometimes that those presets are a little hard to use because chances are you've heard it before. And be oh, just to be fair, in case you hadn't noticed, it's going through an effect plugin. But everything is going through the same reverb, which is um, Tal's We Fella. Now to Xenology. That's a patch that I made, so it doesn't even try to be like the D50, 5080 thing. Xenology covers a lot more synthy side, but there is a great ability to do a lot of the D50 um, XV type stuff, JD, JV, all of that kind of stuff. The Roland sound is definitely doable across the whole thing. Now let's look at the editing. And this is where I say Roland do Roland. And I'm gonna show you something interesting. We can edit a patch. Just look at the architecture. Don't look at anything in particular. Just look at the style of the architecture. We can edit the common features between the upper and lower partials because we have four partials, lower, upper. And then we can edit the partials themselves. Now, partial's a strange name for Roland to have chosen because a partial is another name for a harmonic in additive synthesis. So in additive synthesis, you have your fundamental and then you have first, second, third, fourth, what have you, harmonics, which is used in Yamaha's uh, DX because you choose what your modulator is going to be in reference to your core operator. So they've obviously been looking at what Yamaha have done and had massive success with their DX series and said, how can we sort of DXify our thing? But their thing is still incredibly tied to the Juno thing. In many ways, the layout of a lot of this is still Juno or Jupiter. It's just been digitalized, which is good and bad but they've got this particular structure. That's just what I wanted you to see. Then we go to the XV5080, which is 10 or more years later. I can't remember the, the, the date on these things. Uh, and we, when we find the edit button, oh look, common. We can choose our structures. They're not as complex on this, but you've got other options. We can look at our wave generator, so that's our oscillator and pitching offset oscillator. We can look at our filters, a time variant filter, if you're wondering what TVF means. Technically correct. I guess they didn't want to write VC because they are definitely not voltage controlled. TVA, LFO, velocity and key assignments, a matrix, control switches, and then some routing of patches and what have you. But look how similar this is to the D50. Looks slightly different, but it's essentially still a D50. Just as a Juno 106 or a um, JX8P is essentially still a Jupiter 4 or an SH1. Roland are not adventurous. You can take that as a good or a bad thing. I'm merely stating it as an observation. Now let's look at Xenology. Now Xenology is literally supposed to be the exact core 
that if we run out and buy an, oh, I can't remember the name of it, X, X something or other, 80, if we buy basically anything phantom forward, it's running Xenology. So let's have a look. Oh, look, we've got partials. That's what we're looking at here. But let's go have a look at pitch. Oh, we can look at the pitch of all of them. We can look at the oscillators, all four partials at once. Or we can look at them one partial at a time, which lays out a simple synth. Or we could look at the four filter of each of them together. But they then have this, what to me is a really embarrassing button that says pro edit. I'm so sick of the word pro. If we hit pitch, it will now show me, actually we don't even have to hit pitch, it will now show me all four of my partials, and we need to explain partial fully in Roland speak, in a list. And guess what? Blow me down if that is not basically a D50. It's basically your D50 architecture moved through the XV5080 through to here. Roland are still giving us the same thing that they invented in 1988, which they really invented in, I'm not quite sure how far back it goes, but 1979 or something like that. Now you can see this as a massive weakness, or you can say Roland do Roland, and Roland do better R Roland than probably anybody else, in which case they are the masters of this. And Roland sounds like Roland. They do a very good job of it. So your architecture is partials. Now partial, as I was saying before, technically is an overtone in a harmonic series. So your fifth harmonic is a partial. It's the fifth partial. But in Roland speak, what a partial is, is a synthesizer. D50 was called linear arithmetic. So they were saying, oh, here's a form of additive synthesis. Because despite that people will try to be pedantic and say you're wrong, Yamaha's FM synthesis was additive. You took our basic sine form, we added modulation to add overtones. Roland said, yeah, we don't want to do it that way. We do Jupiter Juno. So they said, we'll allow you to add up layers of synthesizers. Now, when I played you the Xenology, Vangelis Sound, and my Europa Vangelis Sound, remember I ended up playing them together and suddenly they became even richer. This is the Roland thing. A big part of the Roland Sound is that everything from a D50 forward has actually been four synthesizers four discrete synthesizers. So they learnt something from Oberheim's four voice, eight voice, where you had to program four or eight separate synthesizers to get one polyphonic sound. They've kept that. So to get one polyphonic sound here, I've got to program two synthesizer sounds. It's just kind of sad in comparison, isn't it? Now you can hear they're not quite the same as each other. Putting the two of them together, you get this really bigger than most other synths will deliver you sound because it's about layering. The Roland thing is about layering up to four synthesizers that are all doing different things. And how they then interact with each other is where you get those enormous, rich sounds, which can then move around each other and what have you. That's the Roland thing. You can edit visually, as you see here. We've got the choice between PCM samples, so lots and lots of PCM samples of things. Very Rolandy, very much. D50, JD, JV, XV sample sets. They are not adventurous here at all. It wouldn't surprise me if there isn't a single new sample in here from 
the, their days from 1988 forward. It's probably mostly all in here or some subsection thereof. They do give you the ability to jump into particular areas. So I want choir or let's look at the voice ones. So we can narrow things down a little bit, which you're going to need because there is so darned much stuff in here. And that can be good and that can be bad. We can run a virtual oscillator. So it's a software oscillator. The PCM syncs, which are basically a waveform, just another waveform. Mm -hmm. They're super sore. <laughs> Which one are we in? This sounds flat because it's tuned flat. So that's the um, 880 super saw type thing. At the time, amazing. It's still good. Nothing wrong with it. Still works just fine. But we've got lots of other devices which have gotten into bigger, bigger super saws, bigger detunings, bigger this, that, and the other, but it works quite nicely. And then a noise oscillator, which... Probably is an oscillator, that's just a picture. <laughs> Their um, VA oscillator has a certain amount of adaptability to it. You can set up your wave gain, but not in smooth amounts. You can add 6 or 12 dB or chop some off in amounts. Uh, that's just a, a main gain. And then, of course, we've got our level here as well. So nice thing to, to have, nicely thought out. We will set them back somewhere around where they were. And you've got some oscillators which are based around other existing devices, what have you. So a nice, nice set of uh, core oscillators. You've got the ability to move things into an analog feel. They've had that since, I think my JV880 had that. Um, Jave didn't get a lot of play from me, as I've indicated before, but one of my records is covered in it, um, or at least one sound. Uh, spaceship, the original Spaceship, um, is covered in brass from, from Jave. Uh, the analog feel, I think it's a couple of sine waves, so rather than just being one single obvious retro wavy wobble, I think it's moving the um, oscillator tuning and possibly filter settings a little bit. I don't know whether it moves LFO rates, uh, but it's got probably two or three sine waves all moving together so that you don't get a, an obvious, you just get a... And, and if I recall correctly, the manual said something very Japanese about, you know, the with the waves in a boat or something. <laughs> it was it was like that. It was very nice. But the analog feel does work and it does work nicely. Um, so your oscillator, it tells you which partial you're looking at so you can either see it there or here. You've then got the filters, the filter itself. We'll kill the other. There's the stock one, which seems very aggressive, very TB303, a band pass, high pass, a peaking filter, and then these pair. Which I think are there just to match some older hardware. The, the core VCF. We need to fix this because this pulse width is not right anymore. We can't filter nicely. That's better. And they sound very Roland. Which is going to be a blessing or a curse depending upon whether you want that Roland sound. 
Jupiter 4, MG, I can't remember what that is. Similar enough to each other, P5. Unless I miss my mark entirely as a Prophet 5 filter and can sound real nice. That's what I used for the CS80 clone up at the beginning, or we can turn our filter off. And then of course we've got an envelope. The difficulty I have found with the envelopes is sort of several fold. The envelope depth doesn't seem to be 100%. It seems like you can go this far, but so that's a little unusual, but Roland's full of unusual things like that. And they can be very slow. Now they have a lot of numbers, 1023 or 1024. Yay, numbers. <laughs> Good old fashioned MIDI. But in here, this mode, it can be a little hard to get them right, which means that you need to go filter, filter, envelope, partial one. Where's my um, attack? There we go. They've nicely labeled it with attack because it's real hard to find. And even there, because the numbers are so great, it's hard. But if you hit shift, then you can get down into single numbers. So their approach, if we were comparing this to something else, because I think it was $229 to buy this at, right? So if I was saying, okay, well, let's look at buying myself a $200 powerful synth, we'd look at Xenology Pro, we'd look at um, Hive, uh, we might look at Zebra, I would definitely look at Zebra, Predator, um, Dune, all of, the, all of the, the obvious ones. Then they have a much smoother, more modern, nicer feeling programming interface. If, however, you are knee deep in the Roland Road, then you're probably going to love, ooh, it's so Roland. So I'm not going to say whether it's good or bad, it merely is, it's very Roland. So it can be a little hard and take some time to get your head around how the envelopes work. Same with the amp envelopes. So filters, envelopes, amp, there is an EQ, that's fine, very Roland kind of EQ, does what it does. Uh, you've got LFOs, only a pair of LFOs, they haven't really looked at saying, oh, with software we could expand ourselves, <laughs> but two LFOs is generally going to be enough for most things. To be honest, haven't dug into these at all, they look very much kind of obvious, but there's nothing wrong with them, they are going to do whatever you need them to do, more often than not. You've got some sort of a step sequencer type thing in place of uh, an LFO, but it's an either or. You've got two of those. That's it. You're done. Which is where if you're comparing to a, I'm not talking specific features, but a Dune or something like that, you may well find they've got three or four. Um, I've got four envelopes in Europa, four LFOs and four envelopes. So two in total against eight. It's then that kind of math is not good. However, Europa does not deliver roll and sand out of the box. And if you're going to get pedantic enough, I haven't made Europa sound exactly like a DX7. I've got DX7 LA style sounds out of it, but it's never been exactly the same. So swings and roundabouts, not saying anything's right or wrong. You can put into unison mode. Two to eight voices. Not immediately as as many modern synths, but it does its job. So let's put our second partial in. No unison. It gets that sound, that cliche unison sound. And if you're after the cliche unison sound, yes, it does it. Uh, but I think the thing that it sells at is that as we transition from one one synthesizer playing alone to two synthesizers playing together in parallel with each other. So that's two separate patches playing in parallel 
we get something that we don't easily get elsewhere. Not that we can't get, but we just tend not to do. So Roland pushes us down that road of saying, yeah, one synth probably isn't going to be that exciting. But if you put two, three or four synthesizers all on top of each other, and let's say one of them here is running, uh, what will we run? Um, oh, Japanese choir. Who wouldn't want one of them? Doesn't sound very exciting at the moment. Go <laughs> squip, <laughs> squip. Um, this is the thing, it's often hard to work out what what's this is doing. Why is this going, and you go squip. You have to really understand the Roland thing. Oscillator, partial, here, yeah, PCM. Wave left, wave right. No, I don't want them, thank you. This is where it gets clunky. Um, I don't know, it's gonna be somewhere in the settings. But I must admit, just about every time I started looking into these things, I ended up with... <laughs> okay, that's kind of cool, whatever's going on there. But I do find myself kind of flawed and it's not intuitive enough a workflow to easily go, ah, that's where it is because you've got to see things the Roland way and know what's likely to have caused it to do that thing. I don't know why it does that thing. Why is my partial or my synthesizer not playing properly? So it's, again, I'm not gonna say that it's a bad, terrible thing, but to get the most out of this, you need to do what Roland do, which is Roland. If you're comparing it directly to a Hive or a Dune or something like that, you will find there are some frustrations with this. But again, if you're looking for the Roland sand, there's one way to get that. So let's look at just the good and bad. I think they're all relatively self-evident now. The good that is with the cloud, you get quality Roland sands. You don't get anybody else's sands, you get Roland sands, and they are good quality. You also get access to a lot of famous Roland instruments. So even though we haven't gone over them too much here, you get access to, depending upon how much you invest in this, your Jupiter 8s and what have you. Uh, definitely their digital stuff, D50s and what have you moving forward are good. And Xenology Pro is good in its own way. You also get the cute little mini door. Uh, how important that is, whether that's even relevant for you, I don't know. But seeing we do at higher hertz focus to a fair amount on beginners, then yes, you get a cute mini door, which you can do a lot worse than. The bad is that things are a little clunky and you've seen me fall into that hole there. The Roland only do Roland. So if you're looking for something outside of what Roland do, you're probably going to feel like, oh, how can I get that here? Because you can't. Uh, there are a lot of things you can't access. There doesn't seem to be any sample importing. So if I want to import a sample, my own sample of me belching in a jam jar or something or other, I don't believe I can import it. Happy to be wrong, but I haven't seen any signs of being able to do that at all. Roland to do Roland. If you're wanting to do FM or anything, as I say, it just won't happen. But if you invest a lot and you get everything, then you get access to a lot of stuff, which is definitely good enough to have been used on almost every movie that you've watched since 1988. Uh, so it can be a little hard to get yourself started. And if you do start, especially in the um, their little mini door, um, it feels very gamified, as in it's not about being a professional of anything. It's not about a craft. Um, it's this very modern idea of everything's just for a laugh because we're all playing Ready Player One. Um, the problem with that approach 
is that you will burn out real hard, real fast. I just spent a lot of time responding to someone this morning who was like, oh, my mix doesn't work. I'm so, so pathetic at this. I'm going to have to throw away all my gear before I kill myself. Blah, blah, blah. They didn't quite got that far, but I, I want to get the point across. Now, the thing was, I was about the fifth person there who said, hey, your mix is great. Could your mix be different? Yes. Should your mix be different? No. I can hear what you're doing really clearly. Everything is super clear and it's doing its job nicely. I feel no need to turn this off. I don't feel any need to say, oh, if only this had been a bit nicer. It was great. It was technically great. But even there, his sense of, you know, building his piece and his story was way above average. But the problem was that he was approaching everything head on. And he probably thought that making music was the game of cloning, as I joked with his square punch of 48. You know, and I talked about how in 1990 I hit that wall myself of, oh, I've made my first EP and that was pretty good. Now I need to make my first album. It needs to be even better. And there I was sitting there trying to play the game of cloning from 242. Oh, God, it doesn't work. Because guess what? I am not front 242. So the gamification approach that the Rolling Cloud has a lot of on the surface, lots of little devices that oh, if, you, if you download this device with these preset sounds, then suddenly you'll be Knight Rider. It's like F off. That's not the way that a craft is made. If we were to following the Japanese style without trying to be derogatory at all, but if I were to walk into a... Um, dojo in japan you know hello mr mr zen fighting dude um i i want to be bruce lee he might say okay son but he's going to be worried if i then pull out my nunchucks and start swinging them around my head like a total idiot he's probably going to go Thank you for coming, because you're not even going to sweep the floor. Karate Kid Muffins. So the gamification side encourages people to go head on and see it as being a novelty. Yes, I know companies see it as an easy way to, to scrape in cash, but it's a good way for you to get hurt. So that's a big negative, and while I don't like it in any company, I really don't like seeing it in a company like Roland, who have been a mainstay of pure electronic music for, I mean, they go back to the 50s or 60s or something or other if we wanted to get into the ace tones. But definitely, if we were to draw a line in the sand at, say, 1979, Human League, early Depeche Mode, um, and, and all this kind of stuff, Roland, 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 Roland have been a big part of that. Yes, Sequential with their profits were a big part of it too, but Roland have been a big part of the centre of that. Um, yes, there were Simmons drum kits go pow, 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 but then Roland made it more reliable. Roland, Roland, Roland have been a big part of that, but now Roland seemed to be playing the let's all act like three-year-olds playing PlayStation kind of thing, and that's not music, that's not craft. Just as if I were to take my nunchuck and swing it round my head, I'm going to last all of five seconds if I go up against somebody who does proper hurting people for a living business. So pick which way you go. The gamification bit is a, it is a worry and you have to stay out of it. I get why Roland's going down that path because it seems to be the only way that you can score money off people easily but I don't think it's good business. But bottom line, if you're after the Roland thing and you don't want to go out and buy a box with keys attached to it and the limits that come with that, you want to do the Roland thing on your computer, then the Roland Cloud or at least Synology Pro is the way to go. It's the way to do the Roland thing. So I hope you found some value in this and some more understanding as to what the Roland Cloud rings. Benedict again for Higher Hertz. If you have broad questions, ask them down below after hitting the Subscribeify button, please, or pop on over to higherhertz.com. You can do the same thing over there. You have a great day.
day.